very much, Robert. It's, uh, as ever, it's a huge pleasure to uh, come to France, and we've been doing this course for a long time, and still a constant uh, enjoyment for us. So, as Robert says, I work in uh, Windsor, just west of London, and um, this is Windsor Castle, so just to the west. And this castle um, was built by a Frenchman. So it was built originally by William the Conqueror, or William of Normandy, who invaded the UK in 1066. And over the following 10 years, he bought, built this fortification, which is just west of London. And it's at the first bit, the first sort of hill west of London, and it's strategically very well placed on the Thames. It's now the largest inhabited castle in the world. And the Queen, and this is her favored residence and uh, the private hospital where I work is just conveniently located down here. So it's a lovely, lovely spot to come to. Just across the river, so immediately across the river from the castle is Eton College. Now Eton College is quite a famous school. Uh, it was built in 1440 by Henry VI and it was originally built as a school for poor children. 70 poor children would go to Eton College and then when they'd finished Eton College, these same poor children would go to King's College, Cambridge, which was also set up by Henry VI. And things haven't really changed. It's still a school that's well known for taking children of, uh, from poor backgrounds. <coughs> um, and here you can see the poor, impoverished children. Uh, but it's got some famous uh, alumni. So we have our current prime minister, and in fact, Eton has educated nine of the uh, UK prime ministers. And we have perhaps uh, our prime minister in waiting, Boris Johnson. He's our mayor of London. Uh, he was at, at Eton at the same time as David Cameron. And also it's got some famous actors. There's Damien Lewis from uh, Homeland, um, Dominic West from The Wire, um, Hugh Laurie, uh, Dr. House, all, all uh, educated at Eton. Uh, Eddie Redmayne, who's just won the Best Actors uh, Oscar um, so, uh, for his portrayal um, of in the theory of everything. Okay, and then we have our two princes who were educated there. We've also got famous author uh, Ian Fleming, and one of his creations, James Bond, was at Eton. But he was only at Eton for a very brief period in the books because he had an affair with one of the uh, women who worked at the college, and he was uh, expelled. And also Captain Hook was there. <coughs> Perhaps appropriately, one of the more famous sons is this chap. This is Arthur Wellesley, who was also the Duke of Wellington. And I think it's very appropriate to put that up at the moment because um, this is the school that's named after the Duke of Wellington, this Wellington College. This is where my youngest son went. It's uh, again, again a school for impoverished children. Um, particularly of ENT surgeons. But it's appropriate to have to look at uh, the Duke of Wellington because on the June 18th, 1815, so 200 years ago, <laughs> it's a very famous battle, Battle of Waterloo. So Waterloo is in Belgium. It's just uh, south of Brussels, but it, at the time it was part of the Netherlands. Well, you didn't do anything this battle. <laughs> and uh, there's this chap, you might recognize him, the French might recognize this guy. This is Napoleon. And Napoleon had been exiled to the Elba and in March in 1815, he came back onto the mainland, joined up with his, uh, his army and said, you know, your emperor is back. And then he worked his way uh, to take over, take back over Europe. And there was an alliance of the Russians, the Prussians, uh, the English, the Dutch, all wanting to fight Napoleon. And um, on June the 16th, there was a battle between Napoleon and the Prussian army and uh, Napoleon won that, but there were enough of the Prussians came back and Wellington was over with a, a, a massed force with the, with the Dutch and he felt that he could take Napoleon on, which he did at Waterloo. And this is what happened during the day. So these are the uh, French forces, these are the English, and the French kept advancing in, onto the English during the day as the battle went on. And the, the combined English-Dutch forces managed to resist that. And then later in the day, um, the Prussian army came in and the com combination managed to wipe out the, the, the French. Um, and then Napoleon retreated back to Paris and then was uh, deposed really by the French and then was sent to St. Helena. So that was the end of Napoleon where he died a few years later. So you can see that basically by the end of the day, the French had been 
driven out completely. So here we are, these are the Prussians and the Duke of Wellington uh, putting Napoleon and the French in their place. Now, <coughs> now Napoleon, what Napoleon wanted to do, he wanted to have a, a Europe-wide state, basically. That's what he was hoping to achieve. Um, and you can see that the French still try to do that. And the British, well, you may have heard that the British are not so keen on this French state. So this is with Hollande, and you can see maybe they're not best friends. Um, not such a lot of entente cordiale, not like this clinic, of course. Uh, and with the Germans, we're sort of not quite sure how we get on with Angela Merkel. And in fact, the British, we see Europe in a, in a slightly different way from the rest of you. So we, this is the semi-United Kingdom of England, and we see this as the evil federation empire of Europe. So we're pretty skeptical about all of this. <coughs> But as, as you know, we, we on the faculty, we're very different from most of the British. We're very, very fond of our French and European colleagues. You might recognize some of your own countries. <laughs> okay, but we're, we're fond of our, of our European colleagues. And what we found is that over a beer, actually suddenly you can make friendships where they didn't really exist before. And here we are, we're now a friendly group. And, you know, just by a bit of exposure, we can link up with the Germans. And now we're getting in bed with the Europeans and we're all happy. Okay, so just a couple of words about Windsor. Windsor's, uh, as I said, it's, it's that we've got the castle and we have some unique ear surgical problems that many of you will not have to deal with. This is one of our more tricky ones. Um, you know, how does one do this sort of surgery? <coughs> okay, so we're going to go on to vesiculoplasty. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what Manaha said, but he's given you a great presentation. So some of the issues we're going to just go through uh, uh, quickly. But this is Wulstein, and Wulstein was the first guy who sort of really put a classification of acicular plasticity together. So you've got to bear in mind, in the early part of the 20th century, people were not operating for hearing restoration. They were operating for infection. People were dying from mastoid infections. And the whole uh, aim of surgery was to stop infection. And it wasn't really until microscopes came in in the 30s that some of the surgery we do became easier. And Wolstein took it in the, in the uh, 50s. And he did his classification, which we've looked at. So type 1 tympanoplasty is basically a moringoplasty. Type 2 is something we don't tend to do much, but basically they amputated the handle of the malice to allow almost like a type 3 tympanoplasty. You're sitting onto the incus directly. Type 3, of course, we do use and get nice results from that. And then this, uh, the type 4 that, we, that uh, Manahar talked about, be about before, where you get the drum down onto the foot plate, but you try and ventilate the round window. You get good hearing results with that, but it's not easy to do that. It's difficult to achieve that ventilation over the round window. It looks easier on the diagram. And type 5, where you do a fenestration. Uh, and this is Zollner, so the, the, the Germans really took on acicloplasty through the 50s. So what materials have we got? Well, someone was asking yesterday about Malleus head, but of course we've got autografts. And worldwide, the Incus is probably the most used uh, pros uh, uh, way of reconstructing the acicular chain. And we saw a lovely presentation from, from Saji carving some cortical bone to make a prosthesis. And a lot of people you just use cartilage. We heard yesterday in the discussion, Franco was saying that for he'd do a type three tympanoplasty, just laying cartilage, reconstructing a drum. So Incus is probably the commonest use. It's available frequently, it's available locally, it's well tolerated. Um, you do need to be, you see these guys skillfully carving these things and it is a skill to do it properly. And so for many of us, we prefer and find it easier just to use a prosthesis not always available. There the, has been talk in the past about intrinsic cholesteatoma within the incus. Uh, and the chap who spoke most about that was Jan Grote. And Jan Grote used to use that, he has a slide with some cholesteatoma in an incus, but at the same time he was talking about the Grote implants which were hydroxyapatite and you shouldn't use the incus because it might have cholesteatoma in it. I don't think that's an issue. I think that's when you speak at meetings, nobody's ever really seen that. But it does require carving, and you can sometimes get ankylosis onto the head of the stapes. And there is some data to suggest that prostheses actually give you better hearing results. So we've, we've got Thomas Somers. Where's Thomas? No, he's not here. Okay. 
Um, but in, in Belgium, they still use homographs. So they go to their fridge and they can take out an incus, they can take out a stapes, they can take out a cadaveric monoblock with a drum and the complete acicular chain. But elsewhere in the world, we don't use that. We've, they've sort of been banned because of the risk of prion disease. So the main bulk of the talk is just talking about prosthetics. And over the years, we've worked our way through a variety of these. The early plastics used to extrude. Porous plastics, some people still use. You get ingrowth of tissue, and they're better tolerated. But there's been a general move towards metals and ceramics particularly bioactive ceramics, so hydroxyapatite. You'll see with Robert's presentations that this is a material that's extremely well tolerated in the Middle East. It's very nicely tolerated directly up against the drum. Cements, I think Thomas is going to talk to us about hydroxyapatite cement. And then metals, there's a lot of the prosthesis is made of titanium now, and titanium, it's got the rigidity that we want, it's light, uh, and again, it's well tolerated, but probably needs some cartilage uh, over, the, over the top. So the title of the talk is Why Bother? And we had this wonderful talk about the problems of reconstructing the middle ear and results being variable. And results are very variable because one of Manhar's late slides was saying you know, that the ear with the pathology of the ear, if it's poorly ventilated, it's difficult to get reliable results. It's easier in a temporal bone lab looking with laser vibrometry to see what you get. It's much more difficult uh, in, the, in the living patient. We present our results for acicular plasty not within 10 decibels, but within 20 decibels. We present our stapes results within 10 decibels. Well, why do you think that is? That's because if we present our 10 decibel results in acicular plasty, they look pretty poor, and we give up, and we decide we don't want to do it. Um, so that's the only reason we do it that way. The surgery is often technically challenging, but to be honest, that's why so many of us do ear surgery. We like the technical challenge. But the stability long term is of often not what we uh, expect, and I think lots of results at three months are not the same as at five years. And we talked about this about, um, I think Doug was saying that in America, hearing aids are sexy, and they are becoming so, even in the UK. You know, hearing aids are really up their game, and that's something we've got to think about. And then finally, stapedotomy results are much, much better than a cyclopharsy results. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the case for doing a stapedotomy with a mobile foot plate. So this is, you know, the sexy NHS state-of-the-art hearing aid. This one actually comes with a free hat. So it seems impossible that this hag-hugging hat can conceal a 940, but it's true. So you get the hearing aid, the hat comes with it. <clears throat> and as we saw this little chap yesterday, very happy. But now things are moving apace, and we've got completely invisible aids. We've got these things basically just very, oops, hang on a second, sorry. Uh, you know, very, very discreet. And now the hearing aid, uh, the audio here selling these, not as a hearing aid, it's now a personal communication assistant. And you have it with your BMW key and your iPod, um, and that'll have Bluetooth and it'll speak to your phone. And Hearing aids will become, I think, much more acceptable. And this is, this is a recent advert in New Zealand, you know, where they're selling their hearing aids directly with sex. If you're going to be talked about, you might as well hear what they say, you know. <laughs> there you go. So what affects the results? We heard a lot about that in, in the talk. But, you know, when you face with an ear like this, where there's no middle ear ventilation, you're going to struggle to get a good hearing result. And all these things, eustachian tube function, infection, acicular status, mucosal disease, concurrent disease, they're all hugely important. Surgical skill, prostheses that are important, but these other things are frequently out of our control, and we still struggle with the eustachian tube, how to fix that. This is Jack Cartouche from Michigan, came up with his middle ear risk index where he scored a variety of these things. So zero is a lovely healthy ear, 12 is a terrible ear, and that will have a huge impact on your results. So if you want to get good results, pick good ears to operate on. And Manahar's basically been through all of this for us. But as he said, stability is one of the key things. A lot of the other things you compromise to get stability. I think this is well illustrated here. This is from Southern Ireland. And you can see what's going to happen here. Yeah. So you need stability. Okay, I'm not going to go through these because this is Manahar's work, but basically <laughs> saying that if you take um, a prosthesis, ideally it's going to be better going to the malleus handle. Um, ideally, it's going to be better if it goes to the stapes head than the foot plate. And ideally, given that it needs to be stable, the shorter prosthesis, the better. 
in terms of hearing, and we've seen these uh, slides. So we need to know our results, but we also need to know what, what can go wrong. Uh, this is one of mine. Obviously, it doesn't look very nice, so it can fail to work, but we can make the hearing worse. We can give the patient a dead ear. I talked about this alteration of taste. Patients who have an acicular plasty and get a great hearing result don't mind if they get alteration in the taste. If they have a stapedectomy and they get a good hearing result, they don't mind about their taste. But if they get a bad hearing result, then they get very upset about their taste. Tinnitus and vertigo. So we're going to look at a few common situations and what I do for them. This is one of the ones we see frequently. I started off with this apple bound prosthesis, which is HA and doesn't seem to work. And then I went on to uh, Serena Sem Cement. So this is one we saw yesterday in the uh, round table with a fractured incus. And let's just see if we can just run through this. So we, we just, I, to get the cement stay a bit better, I just slightly cook the incus just to take off any mucosa so I get a nice dry surface. And then you take the Serena Sem Cement and you place it on and then as it begins to set you can be begin to take off the excess and you just almost sculpt it so at the end you end up with a really quite nice looking prosthes prosthesis and I thought this was the stuff to use but I found long term that these seem to fall off so I'm not using HA cement but uh, maybe I should try that so hopefully it'll let's go on to the next hopefully we'll go on to the next slide. So I think if you're going to use the cement, it's a bit like Thomas was saying, you need to wait, and that's difficult for surgeons to do. So you need to have some jokes to to entertain your team in theatre. This is a, a clip that I've used on occasion, uh, which is made by Kurtz. And it, this is the key thing to make these Kurtz prostheses that this sits very nicely onto the head of the stapes. This thing then goes on to the incus. You can see there's a little bit of movement. Some people put cement as well, but then it does become quite expensive. Uh, here's an, another one. You can just, basically the, the clip's placed down onto, <laughs> directly onto the he head of the stapes, and it's a very nice snug fit as you push it on. Okay, and then you can just crimp this uh, prosthesis around the incus. Let me just do that in a second. You can do it with a couple of needles, or you can just do it with a stapes crimper. Okay. Hopefully. I used to use these. These are cow prostheses with a flex HA shaft that you can carve to make a sort of clip onto the head of the stapes and a dense <laughs> HA head but I found that they weren't particularly stable over the long term. And although the HA head is lovely under the drum, uh, I didn't find I was getting great results with that. But you can see here how really when it's right up under the drum, it doesn't really incite any reaction. It's nice, very nice material. Um, Robert has shown you his malleus replacement prosthesis, and I think we'll talk about the problems with an anterior malleus handle. And he did a lot of work looking at moving the malleus handle, separating it from the drum and moving it so it's directly over the stapes head. And to do that, you have to actually denude the malleus all the way down to the umbo and then pull it backwards. I think we saw this yesterday. And it gives you a much more vertical uh, assembl uh, assembly. <coughs> and this is Robert's prosthesis. You've seen the new one from Grace Medical with an HA head and a rubber band. And you... Oh, Oh. You basically place the prosthesis, even in the presence of a stapes, as a, as a torp directly onto the foot plate, and then you put the rubber band around the head of the stapes, as we saw yesterday. Uh, and these are a couple of me doing them. So you just basically slide that rubber band under the stapedius tendon. Uh, you need to sort of stabilize the prosthesis as you do it. And it's not always as easy as you might think. Well, it's probably as difficult as you might think. It's easy prosthesis. So you need to stabilize your prosthesis. Again, you can see this is the, with the, the Vincent Universal sitting very nicely under the drum. You need to cut the stapedius close to the pyramid so you've got something to tuck your rubber band underneath. 
and you need to keep cool. And probably the most difficult thing I do in ear surgery or have done in ear surgery is teach this technique to the residents. And I think it's a little bit like this. I hope we've got some sound here. Dangerous part of the act. And the arms are open. And the head is in. Boom. <laughs> So when, I, when I've taught the residents this, this is, uh, that's a bit how I feel, really. So what I do now, I use this thing. This is uh, the Dresden clip, Kurt's partial clip prosthesis. And this is very different. This is very easy to place. And with that clip that we saw in the Winkel clip, the angle clip, it sits really securely onto the head of the stapes. And all you have to do is line it up so that this little, uh, this end is lined up with st uh, stapedius tendon and it just slips on, it's very quick to put on, and they don't fall off. And actually, I ha hate to say this, but this was recommended to me by uh, Wilco Grolman. I never really like to give Wilco credit for anything, but he did put me onto this, and I think it's a really, really good prosthesis. And the residents can do it. Um, so in some respects, it's disappointing. You know, we like the tricky stuff so that we can show off how good we are, but this, I would really recommend this to you, and you'll see in a second, it's made a big difference to my results. Um, so, we do, we, uh, uh, we do put a little bit of cartilage over the top. Sorry. Let's just go and take that there. Yeah, so we just put a little bit of cartilage over the top. And this is combined approach, so you can have a little look through your posterior tympanotomy just to make sure that your prosthesis is sitting nicely in place. You see it sitting here under the drum. Okay, so when I looked at my, my results, uh, I used the ONDB database, which is uh, from uh, the Kaus <laughs> Clinic, um, and I could see that the results were significantly better with this Dresden clip. Um, what's particularly uh, rewarding is that we actually are getting reasonable numbers within 10 decibels. And these are a variety of cases with and without cholesteatoma. What do you do? So I think if you've got a stapes, I would really recommend that prosthesis to you. It seems to tick most of the boxes, particularly the stability box. Where I struggle, and I think a lot of us struggle, is what do you do when you don't have a stapes? And I've been using this prosthesis. The nice thing about this variac prosthesis is that you only need one in the cupboard because it comes with a variable length. Basically, it comes with dummies, and you can place the dummy into the ear to get the right length and then the prosthesis sits into these little wells and you can adjust its length. So once you've decided on the length you, you wish to use with the dummy, you just uh, adjust the actual length of your titanium prosthesis. Occasionally what's annoying, you do these under if you do them under local anesthetic, is you place the dummy in and they're really, really happy and got great hearing and then you take the dummy out and you cut your prosthesis to length and you put it in and they say, oh, it's not as good, it's not as good. So I've had that happen on a number of occasions. So the, I suppose the way around that is not to do them under local anaesthetic. <laughs> but this is what you do. You push the pin down to the base of the well, and then there's this little bent bit of titanium here, and you have a special tool that straightens that, and it just nips the, um, nips the pin, so it gives it to the, the right length. And then there's another tool that snips off the excess, and you, it's designed so that it's left with a tiny little bit of, uh, of the pin sticking up, which locates into the cartilage above. You see how that's straightened up now to give you the desired length. Um, and then you just snip off the excess. But, you know, this is a torp, and it's sitting under a drum, and it's sitting onto, uh, onto the foot plate. And I do say to the patients, it's a bit like balancing a pin on a plate. It's very difficult to make this reliably secure. And you can imagine post-operatively, you know, the patient has a sneeze, the eardrum moves, and the prosthesis falls over. And if you revise these, you quite often find that, that the prosthesis, whatever has been put in, uh, is um, not sitting in place. So with Manahar's study, we need enough length to make it stable, but within those confines, we want it to be reasonably short. We don't want it to be lifting the drum too much. So with that in mind, we start thinking, about well, what can we do to make it more stable? And one of the things we've, uh, I've tried is looking at these, the foot plate shoe. I'm just going to come out of that because this is something called Sepragel, which doesn't exist anymore. So looking at foot plate stability, I've been using this Omega shoe, and I was quite skeptical. I didn't think it made much difference, but I think it slightly helps my results. This is a cartilage cutter, which I've used, that cuts a little cartilage shoe for the foot plate. But with the Omega connector, you place this down directly onto the foot plate, and the, the, the shaft, at the bottom of that shaft, there's a little um, socket 
that sits directly onto the head of this little ball joint. And the idea is it allows the prosthesis to tilt a little bit without falling over. Um, so I think that's possibly helpful, but it's still a very pretty unstable assembly. So we can just, I think we just skip through that now. So the question is, is there anything else we can do to help stabilize that? And Robert's come up with this malleus replacement prosthesis, and I think he's using it in lots of cases. I'm tending to use it just when I don't really have an available malleus, but it definitely gives a lateral stability that we're quite often lacking. And if you combine that with this prosthesis with the central groove, it's quite a nice uh, technique. You've seen this before. This is just the um, Grace medical prosthesis that you can adjust the length. And it's got an HA head, which is nice. And this is the malleus replacement prosthesis. So you have to drill holes through the scutum. You have to go right through the scutum. It's a 0.6 millimeter drill. And you have to remember there's something called the facial nerve that lives on the other side. Uh, so you don't want to drill too far. And you do your first hole, and then you measure with the prosthesis where the second hole is going to be. Uh, and drill right through again. And then the prosthesis is placed through there, you push it down, you have to get these nice and perpendicular to your holes to get the prosthesis to sit nice and flat against the scutum. But once it's in place, you can then adjust the vibrating uh, part of this assembly to put your prosthesis directly over your uh, stapes foot plate. And this is just putting the prosthesis in place. So this central groove fits very nicely under this. So I think when you put this in, there's, there's definitely an improved lateral stability. Um, I'm not using it, I'm using it only when I've not got anything else available. I've, I'm quite hopeful. And then you put a little bit of cartilage over the top of that. Okay, and then the final thing that I do, which uh, a lot of people think is crazy, but occasionally if you've got a very well ventilated ear that's got uh, a poor cyclic status, no stapes, you can do a stapodotomy using your laser through a mobile foot plate. And that will give you, if, if the ear is appropriate, which clearly in many cases it's not, but when it is appropriate, that gives you better results than your acicular plasties because it has the advantage for stapodectomy, it's stabilized both laterally and medially. If you're going to do that, uh, I just use a large loop cow's piston. I put it under the drum and I put a bit of perichondrium between the drum and it seems to be very well tolerated. Um, and if you look at the results, there are not so many of these cases, and you could argue that there's a selected group of better ventilated ears, which is true, um, but they clearly get better hearing results, and particularly uh, getting the air bone gap to within 10 dB is much better if you can do a stapodotomy. So that's what, what I do, but I think the TORP is really, it's really tricky. I think we all find it tricky. So if you want to learn how to do it, we run an international ear course in a purpose-built lab at Wexham. It's very close, close to Heathrow Airport. You can come... Uh, and use all the prostheses, use the lasers, and learn how to do it properly. Uh, and we have uh, universally happy students. Um, next course is on the 12th and 13th of May, 2016. And we also talked about Lion. I'm currently the president of Lion, and so my surgery on a Thursday goes out live on Thursday morning, and Robert's goes out on a Tuesday. Uh, but there are some perils of doing live surgery, and sometimes it's quite amusing to watch it, but for the surgeons, it's not always fun. Hi, Thank you very much. It's actually now, and then maybe, I'm not sure we have time for questions, but we, we've got a session this afternoon, uh, round table, we can address questions.